Do I have to be the one to break the news? Do I have to be the one to tell the world what you know and I know and Republicans know and Democrats are about to find out in 2022? And by the way, the American public clearly already knows, judging by this incredible new poll that I got to tell you about. I mean, my gosh, all time low here. The Joe Biden presidency is over. He has proven to be one of the most ineffective presidents in history. And this is a reminder, everyone, that policy matters. Hello, welcome to the Trish Regan Show. I'm Trish, good to have you here. Do do me this favor, make sure that you hit the subscribe button there on your screen if you're watching on video or download this podcast and subscribe to it on Apple iTunes, the full audio version on Apple iTunes or on Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. It's really important that we be able to talk and have this connectivity right now because again, this is something that everyone should realize, including Team Biden in the White House right now. It is over. A brand new poll out of the Trafalgar Group shows 36% approval rating for Joe Biden. Just 36%. I mean, this is really bad. You've got to go back a ways to find other presidents who were struggling with a 36% approval rating. Now, Trump had one in 2017. That was in the first six months of his presidency. But, you know, you, that's kind of a special situation in part because, as we know, a lot of people were not as forthcoming in polls given the um, stigma associated with perhaps saying you supported Donald Trump, right? Let's not forget that. The other reason is that um, he never had a honeymoon period, right? So there was nothing to really sink from. He kind of always struggled and, and just had that sort of base of support that was willing to tell the pollsters that they supported him. But I would go back to President Bush. Back in 2006, he fell to 36% approval. And that was right after the Dubai ports deal. Of course, everybody was like, wait a second, we're supposed to be all worried about the Middle East. And now you're selling our ports to the likes of Dubai. That was a very big story, remember? And the American public had kind of had it. And you know what? He did not win re-election. Remember that. And this is somebody else who's not going to win re-election here. And I don't know what they're thinking because we all know as well that Kamala Harris is not going to have a chance certainly would not have a chance. She's proven herself to be politically inept and also inept at just getting anything done, right? Like going to the border. <laughs> We're not asking for much. Just actually go to the border where you're supposed to be in charge of the policy. Anyway, um, there's been a real decline, a precipitous decline in these polls. Again, with this latest showing 36% approval rating, this is an all-time low for Joe Biden. It comes on the heels of 42, 43% we saw out of Gallup and Rasmussen recently. Gallup had him at 42% in late October. Rasmussen, a few weeks ago, had him at 43%. And then you saw Quinnipiac most recently at 38% approval rating. And now, here we go, way back down to 36%, 36%. Forgive me, Bush fell to 33%. So he's not actually at the lowest of the low yet. He could still drop another three points and I suspect he will. I suspect he will because people are getting fed up. Now we're gonna be dealing with more inflation issues as a result of the supply chain that's gonna get you know, hindered because of what we're seeing with Omicron. Um, and people are saying, wait a second, we, we hired this guy for a job and the job is not getting done. The reality is he hid during that entire election. Hide and Biden, right? He hid. He would not come forward and tell people what his policies were gonna be. So people thought, oh, you know, he seems like a nice enough guy and we'll just elect him because maybe he'll heal the country and bring, bring the country together. And instead he is a political animal that is using all of these issues to divide the country further and cozy up to the extremists on the left. Let me tell you, that's a rookie move. It's a rookie move because that is not gonna win you election. Those extremists on the left, they're a very small portion of the party. It is the middle that you need to be going for, the middle that you need to keep happy. And you keep the middle happy by putting in place policies that don't gouge them at the gas pumps. And the reality is they've not done that. I mean, you even look at, for example, the death count, which has been horrible, of course, but you look at it and you compare and contrast it with both presidencies, both administrations, and what you see 
is that actually even though we've had this vaccine, there have been more COVID deaths in America under President Biden. So explain that. The answer is somehow to keep coming forward with more and more mandates. Well, Americans don't respond well to that. You know, I may say the vaccine's fine for me, but is it fair for me as an employer to say you can't work here unless you have the vaccine? It might be fair on an individual level, right? I can do that as an employer, my own business, but can the government come in and say that? I think that's the problem here. People don't want to give the government too much power because frankly, they don't trust the government, right? We were set up as a federalist system because our founding fathers didn't trust big government either. And so these are issues and um, decisions that I think Americans just inherently believe should be decided on the state level. And so Joe Biden has already seen the court strike down his mandate on vaccines for businesses. Now the administration is out pleading with businesses today saying, you know what, even though the court struck it down, we really still want you to abide by this rule. Um, we'll see what happens on that. But it's clear that people are increasingly getting fed up on many, many levels, uh, including the sort of hypocrisy, if you would, of the whole COVID test. I think everybody agrees that it makes sense for anybody who's coming from a foreign country to have a COVID test within 24 hours of entering the United States. It's a brand new policy that they just put in. I think a lot of people would say, okay, you know what, that's common sense. So wouldn't you do the exact same thing for anybody crossing by land into this country? You know, given that we have a very, very porous border and you've seen the pictures of all the people being kept in glass cages at the border. Well, this question was put to Anthony Fauci by Peter Ducey over at Fox. I want you to hear the question and his answer. Does that include everybody? The answer is yes, because you know that the new, uh, uh, the new uh, uh, regulation, if you want to call it that, is that anybody and everybody who's coming into the country needs to get a test within 24 hours of getting on the plane to come here. Need the test within 24 hours. But what does that actually mean? for people that are crossing again by land, that are coming into the country illegally, for example. Well, Fauci doesn't really have an answer for that. Listen to this. What about people who don't take a plane and just these border crossers coming in in huge numbers? You know, that's, that's a different issue. For example, when you talk, we still have Title 42 with regard to protection at the border. So there are protections at the border that you don't have the capability, as you know, of somebody getting on a plane, getting checked, looking at a passport. We don't have that there but we can get some degree of mitigation. Is like, there something to do to you test? You know what, it, it's not entirely, right? It's not an entirely um, it, 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 a whole different thing. You, for Fauci to say that it's apples and oranges, it's not, because it's still protecting our people, protecting those in the US. And so there's a kind of hypocrisy involved. If you're gonna be so adamant about one thing, at least be consistent. And this is what people, I think, fundamentally are having a problem with. In addition, of course, all the inflation that we've been seeing, the disaster out of Afghanistan, just horrific. I think everybody wanted to be out of Afghanistan. You know, I'm not going to dispute that. However, there's a way to do it. And the way they did it was all wrong. And really, frankly, disgusting when you think about the politics of it all, that they wanted to be able to have Joe Biden make a speech on the 20th year anniversary of 9-11. Anyway, again, the markets have been all over the place. That was the only thing he had going for him. And now inflation, of course, increasingly an issue, inflation that we're watching and uh, growing concerned about because inflation is a tax, like as if we didn't have enough taxes, right? Inflation eats away at all the money that you've been earning and saving. And effectively, it curtails your freedom, right? You don't have the same kind of financial freedom because you become so taxed by this inflation, up 6.2% in the latest read. Believe me, it's going to get worse, especially now with Omicron. And the Fed, while the Fed has been willing to admit now that, you know, this, this is going to be here longer than they originally thought, that it's not just transitory, the Fed, um, the Fed, I don't believe, will actually follow through on some of its promises now to look at raising rates next year, in part because you know, you're going into 2022 and there's political pressure and all of that. And it couldn't be happening at a worse time, right? You want to be able to have room as the economy possibly stumbles as a result of the new Omicron variant. Anyway, gold 
is one of these ways, I keep saying it and I'm just gonna keep, uh, keep telling you, it's one of the ways you can best hedge inflation over time, right? So if you wanna make sure that your, your money, your savings is not completely eroded by all this inflation, which we get no matter what. I mean, you're talking about two to 3% in good times, <laughs> six to 8%, possibly even more in not so good times. But in, in order to, to hedge that out, you, you've got to have vehicles to do that. And gold is one of the best ways. It is proven over thousands and thousands of years. I know a lot of people are looking at different things. Cryptos, for example. I like cryptos, by the way, but for entirely different reasons. Um, and, and I think you're going to be very, very specific when you're looking at cryptos. But I like gold because it is that one steady, steady instrument that I can count on in my portfolio. So when it stumbles, I go in. I want more of it, right? I, I want that for the long term to help even out any fluctuations. They typically say you should have about 5% of your portfolio in gold. I think that's a good rule of thumb to follow um, because it, it will, over time, just help to, to manage your money and, and give you that freedom that you want in your retirement. So do me a favor. If you don't have any gold, you should look at getting some. And to do that, I would, I would call my friends over at Legacy Precious Metals they're great guys. It's a family run business and they can help you. Tell them Trish sent you and they'll take very good care of you. I promise. 1-866-589-0560 is their number. Again, it's 1-866-589-0560. If you're watching this podcast, it's right there on your screen. LegacyPMInvestments.com is their website and you can go and get a free investing guide, but they'll really be able to help you with this. Do you know, I mean, gold is actually really affordable too. I didn't realize this, but gold, a million bucks worth of gold could actually fit in a shoebox. So <laughs> that's pretty amazing, right? This is something you can put in a safe deposit box at a bank. It's something that you could keep in your own, in your own safe deposit box, perhaps if you have one in your cellar somewhere. Um, or you can get the, the gold-backed IRA or you can do all of it. I just think it's an important thing to consider given where we are with these markets. 1-866-589-0560. Um, it, it's really also critical right now to understand the role of the media in these markets. When you think about the volatility that we have had as of late, I blame the media. You know, on Friday, that was a sort of a special situation. Retail investors were really getting squeezed because some of the margin account activity, a lot of people have gotten into this market and they borrowed to get into this market. I don't like that. I don't believe in that. I think you always need to make sure that you have your emergency fund, your money there, that's working for you, that's in safe, a safe, safe, safe place. But um, you, you do need as well to be investing for the future. And so uh, not on margin. I mean, that, that's, that's not something I think the retail investor should be involved in. But anyway, there's a lot of margin activity uh, given the margin calls that happened on Friday. It was a short trading day, very, very thin liquidity because all the institutional players were off for the shortened holiday weekend and um, the long holiday week and the shortened trading day. So consequently, you saw more volatility. So I get that, but what happened on Monday? Okay, everybody came back in, started buying again. We knew on Monday that the Moderna vaccine was probably not gonna be so uh, hot against the Omicron vi variant. We know that because on Sunday, the chief medical officer said basically that to the BBC, and on Monday, the CEO went on live and did a whole interview on CNBC where again, he said exactly that. The headlines were played a little bit differently though. The, in both the, the BBC and, and CNBC, they, they, they played those headlines very differently. Um, the FT, however, on Tuesday came out with a screaming headline basically saying that, you know, the Moderna vaccine was not gonna work against Omicron. And that sent everybody into a tizzy and you saw the market plunge on Tuesday. And then of course, <laughs> Powell came out and said, by the way, I'm looking at raising rates because we've got a lot of inflation. And so that compounded things. I mean, I would actually argue that if the Fed does the right thing and actually manages this inflation, then that should be a healthy sign for the markets. Nonetheless, you know, anybody who's believing these media headlines, traders fall for it all the time, right? Because they're trading in and out and, and they, they, they eat that stuff up, all these media headlines. But as an investor, as an individual investor, it's really important that you, you have a sense of self, right? That you know why you're in this market, what you're in this market for, and that you, you stay with it, right? There is not a reason to sell all your stocks just because the FT runs a headline. If anything, those are your opportunities to get in. What did I do? I bought into the market on Friday. 
I bought into the market on Tuesday and again on Wednesday. Why? Because when it goes down, that's when you want to go in. You want to go in every week, mind you. I mean, I'm a big fan of dollar cost averaging because timing markets is just basically impossible. I mean, it really is. I mean, there, there's no way and all the data proves this. You can quite time a market. But when things are getting really ugly, that's when you say, okay, you know what? I'm in it for the long haul. This is my opportunity. One, I'm not going to change my portfolio positions based on some headline out of the FT that the traders go nuts with and the rest of the media goes nuts with. I'm going to do what I think is right. It's the reason why I got so frustrated back in March 2020 when the market was selling off 2,000 points in a day. Why? Because the media was making such a big deal. Not to say it's not a big deal, okay? Look, not to trivialize any of this. We've lost 5 million people in the world. We've lost 800,000 here in the U.S. It is serious stuff. But when you're investing for the long term, you need to be able to cut through the noise. And the media has so much noise. I know. Look, I've been part of the media, financial media, my entire career. I know the noise. So focus on fundamentals. Focus on what's really going on. And that will tell you why you need to still stay in this market and look increasingly at getting in on down days. I talk about this a lot, of course, on this podcast. Do make sure you subscribe to it. Do go to my page, my website, trishintel.com, where you can get more of all the news on the economy, the markets, politics, all the things that are really driving your finances. I'd love to have you there. So trishintel.com, sign up for my newsletter as well. And do make sure that you go and check out Apple iTunes or Spotify and subscribe to this podcast there. I will see you right back here tomorrow. Thanks for listening, everyone.